In our last video, we developed some sophisticated symbolization strategies and techniques so that we could symbolize complicated statements. In this video, we're going to take some of those techniques and actually apply them so that we can symbolize quantities. So by quantities, we're typically talking about the possible outcomes of a collection of events. So if I have two events, how many possible outcomes are there? Well, here's an example of two possible things that could happen. The Raptors win or the Leafs win. Pretend we're just talking about any given night. So how many possible outcomes of these two events are there? Uh, well, you can say that neither of them will win or none of them will win. Those are the same. Exactly one of them will win, which is to say one wins and one loses, uh, or both of them win on any sort of given night. Symbolizing these is pretty straightforward. We actually have already symbolized some of them. So neither of them win is straightforward. We can use our neither nor symbolization, and we get the following symbolization. And either one of them is fine. Similarly, symbolizing the fact that both of them could win is also straightforward. If uh, P is Raptors win, Q is Leafs win, both of them winning is just P and Q, no problem. So how do we actually symbolize exactly one of them will win? When we do exactly cases, the easiest way is to conceive of them as actual explicit cases, and then we list them. So we just want to list explicitly the cases where exactly one of them is true. So here is an example. I can say P and not Q, or it's the case that Q and not P. And so notice that these are the two possible cases where exactly one of them win, and I use a disjunction in the middle because one or the other of them could happen. Now, another way of thinking about exactly one in this case is I could conceive it as saying, well, at least one of them will win, but not both. And symbolizing that is straightforward as well. We actually already know how to symbolize both of these things. So at least one is just P or Q. And how do I symbolize but not both? We know but is the, sim, uh, is the uh, stylistic variant for the conjunction, so it's and. And not both is, again, one of the expressions that we just learned, so we can put that in. Now, if you notice, these symbolizations also actually express another thing that we've learned, which is the exclusive or. So for exactly one, when you have two options, that's just saying the exclusive or, one or the other, but not both. So let's go back to the question that we just had. How many possible outcomes of the two events are there? Well, it turns out there's actually four. Uh, the, none of them could come to pass, both of them, or exactly one. But as we've seen, there's two explicit cases there. It could be the P case or the Q case. That could be the truth. There's other ways that we can express quantities in the English language. So at most one is a really common one as well. So how do I say at most one of the Leafs or the Raptors will win? Uh, well, again, I just have to break this down in terms of the outcomes. What are the outcomes that at most one actually allows or says could be the case? Well, if you just think about it, at most one means it's possible that none of them win or neither of them win uh, or exactly one of them can win. And once we sort of write it out in this way or think about it in this way, the symbolization is very straightforward. We already know how to symbolize both of these things. And if I realize that it's an or situation here, the none case could happen or the exactly one case could happen, I just put a disjunction in the middle, no problem. Another way of conceiving this is you could actually ask what are the cases that at most rules out. So when I say at most one, it allows for the cases of none or exactly one, but it also rules out a case as well. And in this case, it rules out the possibility that both the Raptors and the Leafs win or P and Q obtain. So if I want to rule out all or both of them, uh, that's just the same as saying not both, which is something we already know how to symbolize. So symbolizing at most, you could really do it in either way here. At most one of P or Q, you could symbolize in the explicitly listing the possible cases with a disjunction, or you could symbolize by saying it's not the case that the ruled out cases can obtain. Symbolizing quantities of just two outcomes is pretty straightforward. It turns out just to be variants of neither nor, not both, and the explicit exactly one case. But quantities of three are a little bit more complicated. However, we're going to take the exact same approach to symbolizing them. So when I say quantities of three, I mean that there's three possible things in play, P, Q, and R, let's call them. And we can analyze the possible outcomes like we did before, but what we want to be able to do is use our symbolic language to symbolize all of these different ways of expressing the quantities of three things. Now we're going to extend this in general and realize that there's sort of a general lesson here that we can use this knowledge to express quantities of any collection of outcomes, but for now we're just going to stick to three because once we get to four or five or more, the symbolization sentences become really, really long. 
So let's tackle some of the easy ones. We already know how to symbolize none of, so if I say none of PQR are going to happen, uh, that's pretty straightforward. We can just list it explicitly by saying not P and not Q and not OR, or we could, or not R, or we could use this case where we have the negation of the at least one, so not P or Q or R. It doesn't matter, you just want to pick the one that makes the most sense to you. Similarly, symbolizing all of PQ and R is really straightforward, that's just P and Q and R. At least one is just really what OR does. If I have P or Q or R, it just means at least one of those disjuncts has to be true, so symbolizing at least one is as straightforward as that in pretty much every case. So let's move on to the trickier ones. Uh, now we're going to do at least two of P, Q, and R. The easiest way is always to think about the cases that this allows for. So if I think of at least two, it means that exactly two of them could come true, or all of them, that being three of them. So let's sort of just list out these cases. How could it be that two of them uh, obtain? Well, one way is that P and Q are true or obtain. Uh, another way is P and R. And another way is R and Q. And of course, we could also tack on the possibility that all three are true, which is just P and Q and R. So these are things that we already know. And notice that I just put a disjunction in between each of them because at least two doesn't specify which of these is going to happen. It just says one of these things will happen, will be true. Now you may notice that this last thing isn't, strictly speaking, necessary. I could just stick with this symbolization right here, which is essentially the front part of it without the OR, P, and Q, and R. So why is this the case? Why don't I actually need to explicitly state that it could be OR all three of them? Well, remember that OR is inclusive by definition. The logical operator OR is inclusive. So it could be the case that multiple disjuncts are true at the same time. And if that's the case, if you take a close look at what I have there, if more than one disjunct is true, then that is actually the case where P, Q, as well as R are all true at the same time. So in fact, what I have in the green underline there is redundant, and we don't really need to add it. That being said, it's not wrong. If you wanted to symbolize it with the redundant case, that would be perfectly fine. So you just want to pick whatever is more natural to you, whichever you remember, and that's the one you want to stick with. Now there is another way of saying uh, at least two of P, Q, and R. You could actually state the explicit cases as opposed to using this sort of disjunction trick here. And so the explicit cases are as follows. You can say, oh, well, it, it'll be P as well as Q, but not R or it'll be P as well as R, but not Q, et cetera, et cetera. And then in this case, you would have to actually allow for the uh, all three case, because if you state the explicit cases, they can't all be true at the same time. We'll actually revisit this, uh, this sort of idea that they can't all be true at the same time a bit later on. So any of these would be acceptable. The exactly one symbolization, as well as the exactly two, which we'll see soon, uh, typically is easy when you think about the cases that uh, are allowed. Exactly cases are very precise. So if I want to say exactly one of P, Q, and R is true, uh, there's actually three ways that that could be the case. The first case is if it's actually P, if it's actually P that is the true one, and that's pretty straightforward. We have P and not Q and not R. Uh, and similarly, we have the case for Q, and we have the case for R. So we've basically just moved down the line and uh, made sure that the case that we want doesn't have a negation on it. So how do you say exactly one of P, uh, Q, and R? Well, it's just got to be one of these it has to be true. And so we just put these three cases next to each other with a disjunction. Now, I did say something just a moment ago, and I said that the disjunction is inclusive, so it's possible that multiple disjuncts are true at the same time. So do I also need to add on to this, and it's not the case that at least two things are true at the same time? You might think that that's reasonable and that's necessary, but it turns out it's not. And the reason why is because if we have a close look at the top symbolization of exactly one, without that thing that I've added on at the bottom, if you look at it, even though OR is inclusive, which says it's possible for multiple disjuncts to be true in virtue of the OR connective, you should realize that the nature of the disjuncts themselves rule each other out. So if one of the disjuncts is true, it actually turns out it's impossible for the other two to be true. And that's just because of the way that the negations work with the atomics. So this thing I tagged on there isn't necessary. 
However, like I said before, it it's okay to be sort of redundant and it's okay to add this little extra clause on if you just want to because it makes sort of natural sense to you. And, and either of these symbolizations of exactly one is fine. For exactly two, we can do the exact same thing. So I'm not gonna sort of list out the cases like I did before. I hope it's fairly obvious. Exactly two, the explicit cases are P as well as Q can be true, P as well as R, or Q as well as R. And so we just put the ors in between and we have this very nice expression. Uh, just like I said before, we don't have to say and not all of them, uh, but if you wanted to, you could. An interesting thing about exactly two uh, is that it also has other sort of symbolizations that are short and pretty efficient. So exactly two is really just saying at least two, but not all. So if you think that exactly two uh, is sort of naturally expressed in this way, you can just symbolize this. At least two, we already know how to symbolize from before. Uh, not all, well, all is very straightforward, P and Q and R. And then not is just the negation, no problem. How do we link these two? Well, we're just symbolizing sort of what we think the expression means. So the only thing that's missing is the word but, and we know that's the conjunction. So this is a perfectly acceptable uh, symbolization of exactly two. So you should see there's a variety of ways of symbolizing each of these numerical expressions of quantities when we have three objects, or three uh, atomics, I should say. And uh, all of them are fine. It's just really about how you understand it in a natural sense. At most, symbolizations can be a bit tricky in the sense that they're long sometimes, uh, but the same basic principle applies. So how do I say at most one of P, Q, and R? Well, one way of conceiving it is just thinking, okay, what are the cases here that at most one allows for? And we realize that the cases are none of them uh, or one of them. Uh, and by one, I mean exactly one. So none or exactly one, well, we already know how to symbolize these things. So at most just says one of these things is gonna happen. And so I just put a disjunction in the middle. And that's an easy way of expanding our expression power uh, by using the tools we've sort of developed already. Another way you can think about it is just asking what are the cases that are ruled out? So we looked at this when we were considering only two atomics, P as well as Q. So the cases that are ruled out are exactly two and all. So those are the cases that cannot happen if at most one of P, Q, and R is true. But if you think about exactly two and all, you can actually just merge those together into a really simple case, which is at least two. And so if we want to rule out at least two, we just say not at least two, which has a very clean sort of expression there. Finally, we're going to do the exact same thing for at most two of P, Q, and R. We can state the cases here, and the cases are none or exactly one or exactly two, and we could just symbolize each of those and put disjunctions next to them, no problem. This is long, but it's not difficult. It just requires you to know and understand the meaning of what a most two is. A faster way is to analyze the ruled out case, because if you think about that, there's only one case that is ruled out, which is all three of them are true. And so that's a very simple expression that's P and Q and R, and if we want to rule it out because at most two is true, we just put a negation out front. Numerical quantities are really nice and straightforward. You just have to think about them in terms of cases allowed and cases ruled out, essentially. And sometimes you can symbolize them directly or indirectly. It doesn't really matter. You want to just symbolize the simpler version for you and use the meaning of the expression to really help you out. You do need to take uh, some time and some care to make sure that your parentheses are all correct so that you haven't sort of uh, made a mistake with the main connective. And you also always have to ask yourself, uh, should I connect these things with a conjunction or a disjunction? But really you just want to let your natural sort of understanding of the expression really guide you in these cases. We've really reinforced a lot of the things that we can do with symbolization and the syntax of sentential logic. So we've really been focused on taking some sort of like English sentence or English phrase and moving it into logic. But of course we can do the opposite. We can now take logical uh, sentences and convert it back into English because our translation knowledge should go both ways. So here's an example of a sentence and I could ask, well, what does this mean in English? Well, you should object immediately. There's a problem here. I haven't given you the abbreviation scheme, so I don't know what X or Y or P, Q, R actually mean, so I can't really translate this immediately into English. So I'm not going to worry about that too much. 
I could give you an abbreviation scheme and then we could do it. But I actually think that giving the abbreviation scheme sort of um, clouds what I really want you to take away from this, which is that we can look at this statement uh, and even though it's in just pure abstract symbolic logic, we can extract a logical meaning from this. And uh, that meaning is actually pretty, pretty deep. Uh, and we do this by focusing on the logical form. So take a look at the sentence really closely. It has an antecedent and it has a consequent. Let's just look at the antecedent. Do you recognize that form? You should recognize this as a form that we've been using a lot over the past several videos. This is just the form of neither nor. And now we can actually shift over and look at the consequent, and we can ask the same thing. What is the logical form of this? Uh, well, I'm going to ignore the negation sign for now. I'm just going to focus on what's inside of there. And again, this is a form that we've just seen. It's at least two of P, Q, and R. Now I can factor in the negation again. That's no problem. So it says not at least two. So I just need to ask, what does not at least two mean? What's an easier expression of saying not at least two? Well, hopefully, maybe you came up with at most one. So this just says neither nor, and then we have some sort of conditional, at most one. And this is the logical meaning of this statement. So when I ask, what does this mean in English? Well, I could actually write this out in a funny way, and that's really what I would want you to be able to do. You know, you should be able to look at this and say, oh, this says if neither x nor y, then at most one of p and q and r. Now, of course, if I give you an abbreviation scheme now, you wouldn't have a problem just rewriting x and y for whatever sort of strange thing it is in the abbreviation scheme, and you'd come up with an English sentence. Um, also, if you wanted to be fancier, you could be fancy as well. You could say, only if at most one of p, q, and r will it be the case that none of x or y. And that's also perfectly fine, because these have the same meaning. And you know that now. You actually know that these have the same meaning in virtue of our understanding of symbolic logic. So this translation is a really powerful ability. And we have actually been learning how to go both ways, even though I haven't really stressed that you can translate from symbolic logic to English. So here, again, I want to state that I'm not, I'm not saying you're translating into a, a normal English sentence. This is sort of like some like English logic mashup. But the idea is really important. By the end of this unit, once you've practiced a lot, you will actually be able to read symbolic sentences and immediately see the meaning of what's going on in English. And that's a really powerful skill. So in this video, we went over our numerical quantities, focus on case analysis, and it's really all about meaning. Um, but a really interesting end of this is the ability to translate complex symbolic sentences into a rough English meaning and structure. Next, we'll be looking at some oddities of English, uh, of which there are many, and we're going to try and just really round out our ability to symbolize some more sort of complex and subtle English sentences.